HiSec Buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. This is Talking in Stations, a show about EVE Online. I am your host, Artemis Albosa. It is currently Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. Welcome to the show. We've got quite a bit of information for you. We're going to be doing a deep dive into any particular story, but we do have quite a few just updates of activity that's been happening around the map. All right, so firstly, a bit of an exciting announcement. Katya Say, you may recognize the name as the pilot who was the first like transverse all of the systems in EVE Online. I think has some sort of world record as a result, but definitely the statue that you see portrayed here has been working with some other folks to make a really fantastic lore-based machinima series, I guess is the best way I could describe it. It is just phenomenal. One of the best pieces of EVE content just ever, period, end of story. So the first episode came out. It was called New Eden Travelers in the Beginning. And it was phenomenal, been extremely well received. If you haven't seen it yet, I would highly recommend it. But episode number two, is coming out this Thursday at 2100 EVE time. And it will be uploaded straight here on Katya Say's YouTube channel. So if you are not subscribed yet, certainly do so. Make sure you get a notification about that. Of course, like, with how great these videos are, like it'll be shared on Reddit, on Twitter. You will see it around, but make sure you don't miss it because it's going to be great. And if you haven't already, take the time to see episode one so that episode two is that much more enjoyable to you. Alrighty, so with that out of the way, let's jump into some other player news, specifically some combat-oriented things. Sunday show, in case you missed it, we had some fantastic guests on with Matterall, talked a lot about Pochfen and Fraternity's involvement with it, and the fighting still continues there. Rook Capel still has a few structures remaining, Fraternity is still intent on removing those structures, and they successfully took care of a couple of them. In this particular instance, we have a fight and then a follow-up to what happened after that fight occurred. So the story here, Roque Capel had an Astrahas that was in its final Halltimer, and Fraternity was going to come and bash it, but they had to leave. They had to go back to their home system H4 TACH or something, I forget, to deal with stuffed out. There was a breakout attempt or some fight going on. So they all left. And the timer started repairing. But they did get a few people back in after that other distraction was handled and managed to pause the timer long enough to get a few more reinforcements. And they just sort of tried to trickle in and get a fleet together to keep this timer paused. And they actually managed it at the end of things to get the structure on this Astrahas down to 6%. So this Astrahas was almost dead. And they were indeed focusing, as I understand it, their target calls were all damage on the Osterhaus. They didn't particularly care about losing their ships. They wanted the structure dead because citadels in the Pochven region existed before the Pochven region existed. So Pochven is made up of systems that used to be in different areas of space. Navula, as an example. And citadels can't be anchored. So everything there is grandfathered in. If it dies, it is permanently dead. So they were interested in killing it. A rote obviously were interested in defending it, and they managed to do so successfully here just by the skin of their teeth, but generating a nice battle report out of it. They brought in some Vargers and a Dread revelation. Again, worth noting, something unique in Pochfen. You cannot build them anymore. So all the capitals in Pochfen are, were there before they existed. If they die, they're dead for good. Can't get back. So they managed to, to force off and kill quite a few things during this little engagement and save their Astrahas this time. But there were other citadels that also had reinforcement timers and Fraternity were less distracted when those timers came around. So they did end up finishing off another of Rote Capel's citadels in Pochfen. I want to look at the Pochfen Citadel losses just to show you sort of the scope of destruction that this fraternity campaign against Rote Capel has had. People often talk about how marauders can be disruptive or can make fights not happen, which at a certain scale is very true. Like if, if you are 
solo roaming, or maybe you have a group of five to 10 people and you aren't intending to fight against a marauder, a marauder prevents you from taking fights. But marauders also in their current states just enable you as a group to really punch above your weight if you know what you're doing and if you're willing to shell out the cash. Let's be honest, these things are, are obscenely expensive. So it's, and again, you can see that in the numbers. We had 44 versus 68. They were outnumbered. The ships, we had Lokis. I think they were hand Lokis. Oh, they focused Logi. Yeah, hand Lokis. And Munins against some Serbs and the Vargars. And normally, if you have like a Cerberus fleet, as an example, and you're going up against another well-organized fleet, like a Loki fleet with T3 Logi, or a Munin fleet with a decent scimitar wing, you just don't stand a chance of breaking anything unless your opponents make a mistake. What the Vargars and the Marauders let you do is break things. They let you kill things and make the fight bloody. And if the hostiles aren't able to break your marauders or are distracted because they're trying to shoot a citadel instead of you, then it really lets you ramp things up and, and take fights when otherwise it would have been hopeless to do so. Roach just wouldn't have had the numbers to contest this timer. I had a discussion recently about Vargars, or not Vargars specifically, but marauders specifically on Declarations of War when we were doing the Black Mark Awards. And it's certainly, certainly a divisive topic, I should say. But I, I like the state that they're in. Just, I like them. Okay, here we go. Pochvin, Citadel losses. We can see here, Rote Capel, since the offset of this recent campaign by Fraternity, have lost two Astrahasses and two Fortazars, all in Nalvula, um, which had quite a few Citadels. So that those numbers are dwindling and dwindling fast. And of course, there are more timers, like this Astrahas, which was saved. As I understand, it has already been reinforced again. So more content to come here. Uh, it was worth noting, it was mentioned in our break room, and I just wanted to bring it up here again, that a lot of the defense that Rope Capel is able to put together involves bringing in friends. They can't, like, the scale of Rope Capel versus Fraternity is just completely different. It's like a mid-scale alliance versus a block-level alliance. And so they, they have to be able to bat phone to put together the numbers if Fraternity really wants to commit to a timer. So that could be a determining factor going forward in how these timers go. I wouldn't be surprised if they continue to be fun and bloody going forward. Other Citadel news. Let's take a look at V. Now I'll remind you once again on the map, Vidal is the NPC Nullsec region in the north very much surrounded by fraternity space and recently northern coalition deployed with a few of their allies to try and clean up the region the glassing of venal if you will they initially met some decent resistance from brotherhood of spacers who brought in some allies with volta a triumvirate was there there was just a whole host of different groups who showed up very similar to the rope capel situation in Pochfen, where the individual group who is trying to defend their structure stood no chance on their own but a collection of these smaller groups who are all similarly minded in the way that they play the game, to, to a certain degree, just non-block organizations banded together to put up a pretty good... But things are continuing to die over in the region of Venal. We talked about the Fortazar when it died previously. We've also since had a couple of Astrahasses die, two belonging to Boss and one belonging to Truly Fine Corporation. And the thing that I wanted to mention about these is if we look at them They've been stripped of their fittings. And even in the case of the boss one, stripped of its rigs, if it had any at all. You can tell that it, it wasn't anchoring, it was an anchor structure, because it had its core in it. So these, the owners expected them to die. They might have looked at the timer, looked at what Fraternity or Northern Coalition was going to bring for that fight to decide if it was something they could contest. And when they realized it wasn't, they were okay with letting it die. So this campaign might be winding down. I don't have a proper list of all the citadels remaining in the region, but 
we'll have to see and certainly no large scale or interesting fights to talk about just a couple of citadels dying but i wanted to give you that update on how it's been going staying up in the north let's talk a little bit about pure blind fade and declan so these few regions the one alliance comes to mind from these regions is probably Volta and their Greater Trash Coalition, Greater Trash something. I always forget what the C stands for and then I get yelled at, but that's okay. GTC, if you will, have been living up in this area, toilet paper being uh, a part of that organization or at least aligned with it to a certain degree. And recently they've been making some moves with their sovereignty, some um, drops in their sovereignty. We talked about when they handed over some sov to Brave. Ostensibly, as I understand it, it was sold to Brave. And they've since dropped some more sov over to Brave Collective. And even more in the regions of Fade and Declan. If we go to changes here, they dropped all of their holdings in Declan and in Fade. They went over to Volta. So this is an interesting thing to keep an eye on. Toilet paper, they are the kind of alliance that you, you see as a fighters. Fighters, conquerors, they enjoy combat. They're not really interested in settling down. So my running theory is that the space that they had acquired, they acquired because they were interested in fighting for it. They were interested in getting the fights. But now that those fights have concluded, they don't really care for the space. It is an administrative cost they don't wish to have. But because they are also significantly slimming down their holdings in pure blind, I'm also curious if maybe they're prepping to move or to, to do something else, maybe realign their goals as an alliance. So we'll have to keep an eye on them and see if that trend continues and what happens there. But current state of pure blind, you can see Brave is picking up more space, mostly from toilet paper and toilet paper's holdings in fade and Declan have all been shifted to other groups within the GTC. Moving right along, we've got some wormhole news. There was a fight in a C2 wormhole with Test Alliance, please ignore. I think the last time we talked about wormholes, it was again a situation of NullSec groups venturing into J space and uh, not having a fun time. In this particular case, Test had a couple of Fortazars up in J123555, a C2 wormhole, and they got evicted. Wolves Amongst Strangers came on in and decided to reinforce those Fortazars. They set up hull control so the defenders couldn't get much of a fleet in, killed the Fortazars, and got a ton of loot. The battle reports altogether are around 100 bill of stuff killed, but there's a lot more that was dropped and looted because in wormhole space, unlike Nullsec, there is no asset safety, so anything in a citadel when it dies, drops as loot, whether the structure is abandoned or not. I feel kind of bad for tests, because I'm of two minds, this doesn't seem like it was an alliance-sanctioned activity. C2 space is not particularly profitable to live in, so it's not the sort of thing where you as an alliance would be like, hey, let's set up an area here where our members can go and farm some ISK if NullSec is unavailable to them but just perhaps some well-to-do members of TEST who had some assets in there. But they became targets just due to the name. Well, that ends... Or no, it doesn't. Let's, let's get the high sec stuff going. I want to talk about high sec and specifically, I got to find the battle report. So give me one moment. Here it is. All right. We talked two or three weeks ago about a war going on between Bjorn B and his 10.K Corp versus Omega and their uh, high-sec Poco Empire. And that fighting has escalated and uh, a really significant battle took place over what I understand is the war headquarters for the War of 10K. And they, they lost the battle, of course, but the battle report was interesting. We had just absolutely huge numbers fighting against 10K here. The vast majority coming from Wrecking Machine, who are an interesting group. I want to pull up their website because it looks really cool while I talk about them. There it is. Just a fantastic design, but they also have an interesting style. So Wrecking Machine became well known back when Citadels were coming out and just being absolutely spammed everywhere. 
because they took it upon themselves to sort of be like the cleaning crew of Hysac. They would go around and just kill citadel after citadel after citadel, and they would take the loot and pay their members for participating, to the extent where they would even say like, hey, you don't have to be a full-fledged member of our group, stick an ult in, and just join in on some timers. So they had great doctrines, they had alpha skill plans for flying a phantasm, it was just amazing. Oh, thank you for that call out. We have since fixed the gray screen. Don't tell him, maybe he won't notice. Come on now, don't be mean. <laughs> okay. Anyway, now you all can see the, the beautiful web design here. Where was I? Wrecking Machine, right. So they were a fantastic group. Judas is the figurehead of the group, known for his Alliance Tournament piloting, or Alliance Tournament ship piloting, excuse me, and low sec piracy. But... Just an interesting group all, to, all around, and they participated in this in a pretty significant way, bringing an exceptionally large Ferox fleet, which you don't even see on the battle report unless you expand everything else. And if we look at it, these are all like low skill point Ferox's, or at least the story that I'm told is they were all low skill point pilots or high sec pilots who were relatively new to combat, but they were all ushered together and taught how to be F1 monkeys for this particular fight, ended up winning. The Feroxes plus Apocalypses and Navy Apocalypses from Black Flag were fighting against Ishtars from 10k, a fantastic doctrine choice. I think I talked about it a little bit in the past about how the, the drone assist mechanics plus just the engagement profile of the Ishtar makes it a great choice if you have to deal with a, a lot of different factors, especially in high sec, when there aren't bombs, there aren't smart bombs, defanging is significantly more difficult. So I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, the Ishtar as a doctrine choice. It just unfortunately didn't work out with the huge number disparity in this particular case. So that was a good fight. People had some fun. I'm interested to see how this continues. If 10k pick themselves back up and continue on the assault, or if Wrecking Machine joining in is like just too much to handle and they won't be able to continue. So we'll have to find out. Maybe I'll check in with Wrecking Machine in the future. They're pretty cool guys. They have a good story and they do a lot of different stuff that's not your typical content that you hear about or that you might even know is possible in EVE Online. So I'd love to talk about them a bit more. Let's talk about some game news because there has been quite a bit of game news happening recently. Okay, I don't have any, any documentation or visuals to show, but there's some drama that was trying to be stirred up about a policy change CCP recently made to the way they handle spam for recruitment, specifically when it comes to new bros. There was a, a very well-known new bro recruitment spammer who basically got a final warning from CCP. They said, hey, we changed one of our policies. This is how it impacts you. This is how your behavior needs to change. And so then he's like, okay, well, I guess I'm shutting my corp down now because it only survives based on spamming recruitment to everybody. And uh, we've seen mixed reactions, I think, as a whole. Everyone I've seen who has looked at this is like, wow, CCP is changing policies to help new bros. That's cool. The spamming is going to go down. Awesome. Oh, you're this guy who is spamming everybody with recruitment nonsense is... um. Gonna have to shut his operation down? Sorry, not sorry. I just wanted to bring that up as a note. You may have seen the drama. I don't really want to get in on the drama because I think my perspective is fairly clear on that. But it is nice to see that CCP is changing their policies. And I specifically, like, as somebody who, who works in HR, like, reaching out directly to somebody and saying, hey, this policy has changed. Here's how it impacts you. That's the kind of customer support that you love to see, as opposed to just changing the policy and banning people as we saw sign kind of accidentally happen with gankers a little while back. So it's nice to see CCP's learn some lessons and handled that one particularly well. So there's that. In other game news, we have some a patch. It's Tuesday, of course, which is patch day. We had a decent one with some changes we talked about last week and also some new things. So let's jump into that. Patch notes 20.02. Gotta love the symmetry there. First and foremost, Dynamic bounty system. I'm hoping to do a good deep dive about this on Sunday with some from different perspectives from different groups who interact with the dynamic bounty system in the ESS. 
But just as a quick rundown, the way that this change shakes out, it seems that the intention was to increase the value of the reserve bank, make it more worthwhile as a mechanic to interact with and really give value to people who are not just farming the keys, but using the keys to extract wealth from the reserve bank. They also wanted to respond to player concerns about null sec income, specifically ratting income. So there's a metric to determine how safe a system is based on how much has been destroyed in that system recently. The higher this index, the more dangerous the system is, the more isk you're going to get if you're ratting in there, versus the lower the percentage, the less isk you get out because the system is more safe. And the idea was to force people to move around so they can't build castles, basically create a dynamic bounty system, as the name would imply. Now, not many people like this, as you would imagine, nerfing income never goes particularly well. And so the, the hope was to bring the floor up a little bit. And the way the math works out, if you're working in a system that was at the floor, at the minimum level of income, based on the dynamic bounty system previously, your income now, if you extract from the ESS, is more than doubled. So basically, CCP said, hey, now some of that ISK that was previously just poofing into nowhere, the bounties that disappeared into the ether of space, now it's going into the ESS. And so if you can extract that wealth from the ESS, you are going to be able to capture more of it. So the incentives they're trying to create here, I think, are pretty clear. There are concerns that for a lot of players, it's still just not worth it to rat in a system with the BRM, the bounty risk multiplier, that is particularly low just because you have higher income alternatives or you're going to move to other space. You're going to do what the dynamic bounty system tells you to and just move to space with a higher BRM to get more. There's also the, the fact that the way the ESS plays out and the meta surrounding it is a bit controversial, to say the least. And also with the reserve banks, uh, there's some interesting economics at play in terms of who really sees the value of the reserve bank. Is it the people who are farming the keys in low sec, or is it the people who are using the keys to extract the wealth out in low sec? So there's just, this is a, a really great discussion topic that touches on a lot of different things. And I'd love to get some good guests this coming Sunday to dive into it. If you are one of those people who farms in a low BRM system, your income is going to go up if, if you protect your ESF. Also, the Alliance Tournament prize ships have been officially released to Tranquility. They have some pretty nutty bonuses, as you would expect, with Alliance Tournament ships. For those unfamiliar, these are specialty ships, very limited in their numbers. And as a result, they are overpowered, to say the least. These ones are based off of the Immortus Legion ship line. So we've got the Raiju, which is like an electronic attack ship version of the Garmer. We've got the Laylapse, which is the heavy interdiction cruiser version of the Orthrus. And then we, we just have those two. There is no battleship version for Alliance Tournament ships. If you are an Alliance Tournament pilot or somebody who wants to purchase one, definitely dig in, hop into Pypha or whatever you need to do to, to drool over them and see if you can purchase one. There are more this time around than in all previous tournaments, so they're likely going to be cheaper. Maybe. There's certainly a higher supply, but these are also really good ships, so who knows. There are some other things in the patch notes that you might need to look over. Specifically, we talked about it last week because we saw it on CC, was that Potchman and Needlejack filaments no longer can be activated within wormhole space. The, the crabs cried out in pain and the PVPers rejoiced. That's a change that people have been asking for for a long while. We also have Needlejack filaments no longer have a chance of sending you to the same region you are already in when you activate them. So again, this is just something to help out those who are seeking to PvP in Nullsec, but their area of space is particularly active or they just get an unlucky roll that helps to prevent this. There were also quite a few changes to the skill UI and some other features that unfortunately resulted in a bug you might have noticed if you've logged in recently. CCP is well aware of this. Thanks to everybody for reporting those bugs and putting it in the general feedback threads. And they are actively working on a fix. That'll do it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed. See you next time.